As you know, I've been working on a story about the King County Executive and his alleged misuse of the Executive Protection Unit. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start off our interview with reading a quote from Sue Rar, okay, who is the former King County Sheriff, as you know. Yes. And after you elected, it sounds like you leaned on her for some support on how to get your administration up and running. And she said this about your leadership style. Okay. Um, she says, quote, you have, you have to have an internal procedural justice first if people within the organization don't feel safe and respected and listened to, it's going to be very difficult for them to go into the community and make people feel safe and respected and listened to. I know that's a top priority for her, building that internal cohesion. Now, knowing that internal cohesion is, it sounds like one of your top priorities, you know, how, what was your reaction to those allegations that the King County Executive, Dow Constantine, um, was more often than not using his um, executive protection as more of an Uber service than as the highly trained detectives that they are to protect him? So um, I guess we might have a difference of opinion to what, to what degree, but what, what I um, wasn't aware of, and even back when I talked on a Cairo radio show, um, no one had ever come to me and said, uh, we don't know that we're being used to the best of our ability and the service that we should be providing. And so when, when that doesn't happen with an organization, when, when that doesn't bubble up to the top, it's really hard for me to influence and help make change. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I would say is that, um, you know, as you know, I've had the whole team in here to speak with me. Um, I've made clear to them that there's that it's, there's no way that me or anyone in my office will retaliate retaliate against them for coming forward with any complaints they might have. I'm glad that you brought that up because um, there were allegations as well that part of the story was that you know Dow Constantine is very retaliatory, and that there were even allegations that within the sheriff's office that it was retaliatory as well, and we talked about a quote-unquote witch hunt that I had heard of and you came forward and said hey um, I you, you you put out an email that said you want number one you wanted the new EPU SOP procedures on your desk by June 17th mm -hmm. that was a directive number two that no officer was to be retaliated against either if they were a leaker or not and Correct. then number three in response to that you also said that these new SOP guidelines w will be put in place without the input from the executive what do you hope that the new SOP and for the EPU will accomplish so I'd have to look and see exactly what I said about the last sentence about without the input from the executive, but I think that um, that what I hope to accomplish, and I will tell you that 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 information, the dr first draft of the SOP was brought forward to me on the 16th. I think I got an email on it mm -hmm. um, somewhere in there, but and and we're still refining it, and we're drawing upon across the nation executive protection. SOPs so that we can have a really well refined and um, so people really know their roles and responsibilities and that's what SO standard SOPs or standard operating procedures are supposed to accomplish. And so do you in this new SOP will it have I know that you can't talk and broadly will it have a, something in place where the executive has to have the detective with him and not down the street or you know if he's at you know having a meeting in a bar or a restaurant you know that that you know if their purpose is to protect him in case of an emergency it doesn't make sense that they wouldn't be near him during the possibility that an emergency would happen so so let's talk broadly okay. it is it is my belief that to provide proper protection for any executive and that's and that's what we're looking at here um, because what if there's uh, some some threat against uh, it's a superior court judge mm -hmm. or uh, one of our council members or something like that we have to be prepared to provide them protection and that security and so uh, this provides an opportunity for us to to, to say here's what uh, executive protection should look like this is what we're training and this is our standard and so um, we need to be able to provide protection by you know it's not just a driving service it is actually about doing the right thing and being in place to take action.
So you think that, that it, 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 they need to be near him in the event to, to actively effective to effectively give security, they need to be right next to him yes. in order to do that. Well, in order not to right next that. to him, but they need to, they should be in the in the in the room. So, for example, if you and I were meeting and having and as we're having this interview, if I needed executive protection, we're having an interview and we know who's in the room with me, and they would be outside. Yes, they don't need yes. to be physically in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I'm a bad example because I kind of know how to take care of myself. Well, you, ha you have a gun. I, so. <laughs> I, have, I, have some, yes. I have some skills. Mm -hmm. So, um, but but in, in essence, yeah, in a, in a place and be, be able to respond and, and serve and protect. Let's see. And then when is the, the timeline for the new SOP? When will that roll out? When do you think? We are fairly close to getting that done. Okay. Yeah. And it just hasn't made its way to my desk yet, so it's getting refined. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I said, we brought, you know, we looked across the country for these things to well, say. What does that look like when you look across the country? Well, like, how does that, what yeah, is that? Here's yeah, here's what's interesting. Having um, protection details are really common on the East Coast. They're common in California, and not just for, you know, the, the county executive. Um, the mayors, the mayors here, mm -hmm. and the, the city police chief have protection details here in Seattle. So Chief Carmen Best has an executive protection unit. Yeah, oh. and and rightly so. I mean, there are events that we are at, and things are going on around us, and there's lots of people around us, and you know, in the day and age of of today's politics and the um, the divisiveness of it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't know, and you want to be safe, and well, so. And that was the big part of the story that p most people agree that the King County executive needs protection. It's just th that how it's being utilized is is not really the way that it should be utilized. Well, I, and I think again, it's a it's a perspective, um, and so th are there ways we can do it better? Yes, mm -hmm. um, and you know. In this day and age of, of trying to pinch pennies and to make cuts, I call it the King County Sheriff's Office patchwork quilt. And I'll explain it real briefly. I know that I don't want to make your story too long here. Oh, no, don't worry but, about it. But um, over the course of time, we have taken so many cuts in staff members and other ways to find efficiencies so we don't have to cut cops mm -hmm. that we've, we've made things do. And in making things do, we've given people ancillary duty assignments. And part of that is taking a criminal intelligence group of folks who are supposed to be doing the quiet behind the scenes intelligence gathering for the, for the sheriff's office to keep the community safe, to make sure that, that um, we're looking at threats and communicating that within the sheriff's office so that we can respond to threats and take care of uh, threats to people and places and those kinds of things. That we've, we've moved in people that had different assignments before. Mm -hmm. So we've crunched in child find into the criminal intelligence unit. We've crunched in uh, assignments that used to be task force members. We had detectives actually on task force. And now our detectives do that in their spare time on top of everything else. You're talking about the doing. EPU. They, and, they do that. Well, everybody in the intelligence group. Because we, yeah. they've called themselves an EPU, but the intelligence unit is already a unit. So it's been a subset of those department members, those detectives, that have been involved in executive protection. So my understanding is, too, is that it's one full-time employee, and then the others are rotated in. And give as, a relief give, factor. Yeah. yeah. Or work overtime on a weekend when the, the full-time members off, yeah. So we tried to tried to do all that, and so you've got folks that are 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 doing the work that they love, and then they're also doing driving, and they're doing all these different things because we've tried to to fix things as best we can and make do. Well, and I think that you've done a really good job of doing that, from what I hear. I mean, it's not the protection is there it's just how it's being used but we've talked about that so I'll sure. so I'll yeah. like I won't beat a dead horse on that one That's but okay. but what do you think will happen if the executive doesn't adhere to the new SOP if if as you say you know th that directive is put in there that the person needs to the detective needs to be close close by close hand if in in the event of an emergency what what are the protocols if that doesn't 
happen? Well, as, as you know, and, and you've heard us talk about this before in general, I think, is that I, I have no control over what the executive does or doesn't do. I do believe we'll come to agreement on what the best practices are. And I know about that the executive is interested in best practices. And there's been times when he's, you know, he's waved off, you know, detail protection because he's going to go do something else with his family or what have you. But it's, you know, it's, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I would imagine it doesn't happen to me, but I would imagine having full-time protection at times, um, you know, you, you don't get to move as fast as you're used to moving. But he doesn't, he chooses when he wants to have the protection. He doesn't have to have it all the time. I mean, there's no rules that are saying, you know, you, you have to have it, right? No, he can choose when he... He when gets to he, pick and choose when, when he, he wants it. When he or his staff feel that he needs some executive protection, we can do that, yes. Yeah, because like the President of the United States, they, they, don't, that, they don't have a choice. They have to have their security That's detail. Correct. Dow Constantine, as the King County Executive, does not have to have it. And in fact, he sends a calendar of when the days that he wants it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So now, you've made it clear that there was to be no retaliation against any perceived leakers. Correct. And to my knowledge, my, you know, nothing has happened to anybody, you know, as a result of the story. Correct. Even that, that, that can't be said, the same can't be said, allegedly, the King County Executive is still using the EPU as, at, at times, as like an Uber service, and that, in fact, the um, sources say that he's in fact retaliating against the detective in my story that wasn't even my source that that he is that he tried to get off the EPU because he believed that he was my source and that since the story has broken every time this detective is called on he calls off the executive calls off the EPU well, and this, you'd have to ask the executive about that. I, I will, but yeah. I'm asking you right now because the last time, the fifth time since the story broke was over 4th of July and the naturalization ceremony there. And apparently um, the King County executive allegedly found out that um, this detective was going to be the one on duty and he called him off and then called the mayor's office to have, to see, the, the mayor of Seattle's office said that he called to let them know, or his executive deputy called to let them know that, that he wasn't going to have his EPU and that, um, you know, was there going to be SPD there? So to me, and I've, I'm, t I'm talking to the mayor's office and, and they're getting back with me, there's, there's kind of a fine line between um, were you made aware of that um, from the mayor's office and what do you think about it? I mean, you guys I, have the contract. I'm a, I'm aware of the information. I wasn't um, when I think when you asked uh, my chief of staff about it. Mm -hmm. I may have that wrong, but I think that's it. And I wasn't aware of it at the time. Um, I, you know, it it depends on. I don't know what was said. And you, re if you ask the executive and or his staff, whoever was involved in it, I think you'll get the best answer. I will say this: there, I. I think he's trying to do the right thing. I think that he is, um, you know, taking to heart that and taking, like, if he's going to the 4th of July with his family, um, that, you know, he doesn't need um, or want a protection detail that day. Uh, well, he's he, trying to do the right thing. He, and, and if you don't have the answer right now, I can just put a pin on this and email Liz at another time and get a comment. But. It is my understanding that he did want protection there and has had protection. At, I mean, this would be the time when he would need it in front of a crowd of thousands with him being on the you know, podium giving a speech. I mean, would you not say that that would be the time that, given all of the times that he's needed executive protection, that that would be the time? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna answer that because I don't think that I'm the right one to determine what he views he wants and needs for protection. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Well, I would say that I. I don't know. I haven't talked to him specifically about the Fourth of July. I don't know what his thoughts were. I don't know what conversations were had. Um, but I do know that the executive knows about labor agreements and that he wouldn't do anything to have an unfair labor practice brought against him. So I, I think, you know, if somebody on, on his staff 
uh, had communications with Seattle. I don't know the content of those, and so I can't speculate. But I know that, you know, he understands labor. So what about getting back to the retaliation against this potential, this detective, allegedly? You know, this is under your purview. You know, this is one of your, you know, one of your people. If it is happening, what what can you offer this detective? And, and I'm sure there might be, you know, something up the chain, and that's for this detective to put that process through. But what are your thoughts on, on well, that? I've bypassed the chain with them. I have told them I will meet with them off-site. I will meet with them via phone call. I or talk, you know, via phone call. I will go outside of the county to meet with anybody on that team who feels that they're being treated wrongly, that they're being retaliated against by anyone, and that we'll, invest, we'll have it investigated. We'll put it in our investigation system, we'll look into it, or we'll send it elsewhere to be investigated if it's outside of my control. And that's a tough position for you because, as you know, you know, as this is a paramilitary, you know, based organization, going against your sergeant or going against, you know, like there's a chain of command. And so I, when you say this, I believe you that... I said it in front of my chain of command. And so, and the reason being is I've had people come to me and say, hey, can I meet you at such and such a place? I want to make sure that you get information about something. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate it. And I also value the chain of command. But when, when something happens that I think is critical to the well-being of a unit, that they, they're, they're um, you know, detectives, been on the department for a period of time, a length of time. And if, if uh, they don't come forward, knowing their time and experience, knowing that I've told them face to face in this very room, that nothing will come of mm -hmm. of this. Now, that if they don't come forward, what more am I to do? I know it's it's That's, a tough thing. That so, becomes the question, and so I would ask them to step up as human beings. If something, if they're being treated what they believe is unfairly, then let me have the opportunity to investigate it. You know, and if we find out that everything's okay, great. If we find out otherwise, then we take action to help them because that's the purpose. They have to be able to perform well. And so even, so if this detective, and I have no idea what their plans mm -hmm. are, but if they do end up going forward and coming to you at some mm -hmm. point, even though it would be going up against the King County Executive, you've got your man's back, is what you're saying. Well, I did this yesterday at, um, in front of another camera for another reason, and I did it at a graduation. We had a graduation of six new members to the Sheriff's Office out of the Police Academy, and I told them, you follow the rules and regulations of the King County Sheriff's Office to the best of your ability. We're all going to make mistakes. I will have your back, and I will have this team's back, and I will do what I can to make their job easier. The only thing I ask of them is to be given the opportunity. Yeah, I think that's fair. You know? So if this, you know, you said that the King County Executive, if he, um, he knows the rules about working with another organization, and that would be quote unquote skimming is what I've been told that it's called, if, if he's getting protection from the SPD, if it ends up going that way. I believe that's slang for it, yeah, but it's an unfair labor practice. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah, so that that's what that's what it would be, though, if, if, if I, and I have, like, a, I said a call out to the guild on it, but that, potentially, that's what it is. It could be. It could be, okay. But again, n n neither you nor I would exactly was said on the phone conversation. Well, I know Did that... Did you talk to either end of the phone conversation? Um, well, I, I didn't. I haven't talked to Dow Constantine's office yet, but mm -hmm. I did get confirmation from the city of Seattle that um, that his uh, deputy, his executive deputy, contacted them and said, "Hey, Constantine's going to be here without his EPU. Is there going to be, you know, SPD detectives or SPD there?" So I think it, it's kind of a splitting hair thing at the moment. Which is, would you consider that giving him protection? If I, you know, it wasn't an ask for protection. It was just whether or not there are going to be SPD cops there. I think that, that that'll be something for the guild because to me it's like if you're asking for them to be there, you're, it's assuming. I mean, he's a, very, he's a highly visible public official. He's the King County executive. I mean, 
he needs protection at this type of, of an event. You know, I, I think that him asking that, um, some would say that him asking was asking for protection, but the mayor's office is not saying that. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Okay. Okay. That's why talking to whoever was on the end of the phone, you know, there's going to be two stories to it. There always is two yeah. stories to it. One yes, more. there. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yep. exactly. Okay. Um, so let's um, talk about the um, briefly just a couple, a few questions about the ICE and the King County giving um, ICE access to in, in jail inmates information um, more than a thousand times over the last year, and they also gave info on 25 people without a warrant because they didn't have the training. I just, I know that you put out a press re press release. Can you say anything about moving forward, what your office plans to do, um, and just kind of give us an update on that? Sure. I can't speak to what happened at the jail. The jail answers to the, to the executive, mm -hmm. so the jail director works under the executive. So those are not my employees at all. Oh, okay. I, I don't have any interaction with them. Um, there, we had a, a couple dozen um, instances where we released uh, case reports uh, where a suspect is listed to um, the federal government, in particular to ICE, and so. Uh, what happened there, our, our records department is responsible for, they take in hundreds and thousands every year of these requests. And they, um, some would say, are very overworked. Mm -hmm. uh, they're professional staff members, they are not sworn, they do some miraculous work in the records department. Um, they made a mistake in failing to quantify what the information was going to be used for. And so those 24, I think, maybe 25 case reports were, were released. Um, and what was needed was, a, it was like a, um, they needed to ask the question if it was a civil. Yeah, we, I think, um, I, I don't know the specifics of what we did or didn't ask, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it truly came down to a training issue with them. Um, it is also, uh, a unit where there's been some transition of people moving to other assignments in King County and so I'm not making excuses mm -hmm. um, we failed and so I I that that's becomes on me it's my responsibility when anything in the sheriff's office um, happens and we do do wrong and I want to be really transparent about that um, in this particular instance it was human beings who made human mistakes and so we've, uh, even through today, been able to correct that and, and pull those uh, case reports back electronically from where they are. So the, the two dozen, those were pulled back? The access to them are pulled back, yes. Okay, and then the passwords have been changed that I still had access to? I, I don't, I just know my IT people said, hey, we handled it today, so I don't have the exact detail to give you, yeah, but I'm happy yeah. to give it to you after the fact. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Again, what was your feeling about, like, I had read something about you. I've done a lot of research on you in the last, you know. I am so sorry about that. No, no, no. I was very impressive, your, how you've come up through the ranks. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that you talked about was um, when you've been on patrol, um, this resonated with me, mm -hmm. that, you know, you would come up to a, a car that had an African-American person in there, and it would make you cringe inside to see the fear that, they might be experiencing as a result of your presence, even though obviously you know you you meant them no harm, and for whatever reason it was a legitimate stop, right? Yeah, that's, absolutely, that's true. And and so because I, I think about my daughter, my daughter's a, a woman of color, and through her, she reminds me all the time and nags me. Through her, I'm informed about things that, as a white woman, I have no experience with. And so how do you think, how did it make you feel when you found out that this breach had occurred in terms of like how that's going to affect the community mm -hmm. at large and how it does affect, I mean, this is such a polarizing issue mm -hmm. that you can say and, you know, there's facts to back it up that it was a, it was human error that it happened. It wasn't sure. intentional. In many cases, you know, it has been intentional that information has been given to ICE, but it sounds like this was not no, one of those. No, this was not. You know, what, what do you think this has done in terms of, you know, long-term harming and getting back to your daughter yeah. and, and those feelings in the community of, of people of color? Well, it breaks my heart because 
one of the things that I had the opportunity to do was go up without being asked um, when the King County Ordinance was being formed on immigration um, to go up and, and speak during the public speaking time and say, you know what, thank you for moving this forward. I hope you vote to approve it because it takes the office of sheriff out of being able to make changes in the future. So sheriffs after me can't go back on what's been King County Sheriff's Office policy for most of my career. For over 30 years, our policy has said we will not ask immigration status. We are here to do the, do the law enforcement service and the public service to the community. We don't need to know that information. It's not important to us doing our daily work. It's the federal government's job to do the rest of it. And so my heart was broken. I feel so, um, I feel sad and sorry and, and share that, but I take responsibility that that happened and we will do better every day. And how hard is it for you? Because on the flip side of that, the public safety issue, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people, you know, they want undocumented people to be, you know, left alone and just, you know, they came here for a better life. And, you know, that story resonates with most Americans, I, w I would say, you know. But then there's this other piece, the public safety piece, where, you know, you've got, when you know um, that you've got a criminals with history that are undocumented, as a person that's been in law enforcement for over 30 years and the King County Sheriff, like, how can we bridge that gap? Well, you know, first of all, it's really hard to know if you don't ask the immigration status. And so, you know, our folks go about doing their work every day and, you know, we take uh, and investigate crimes. Um, we do other things in support of folks. Um, we do our best to help folks that have um, learning disabilities, are in crisis for a variety of reasons, behavioral health or otherwise. We have uh, a mission to serve the public. And so, when you don't ask immigration status, you're, you're not necessarily, I don't know how you find out whether somebody's uh, not in the country with uh, residents, that, green card or those abilities to be, to, to be documented in the U.S. So, um, so I will tell you that's not impacted how I've done policing. I've still put bad guys in jail. You know, I've still made plenty of arrests for violent crime from homicide to rape and others. And, and that's how we focus on doing the work. Um, and, you know, whether or not we, we caught folks that, or I personally put away folks that were undocumented in this country, I don't know. And did you have anything that you wanted to say about the Charter Review Commission? I did a story. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Which thing might I be interested in? Well, that the fact that your <laughs> position could be not elected, even though the voters overwhelmingly back in 1996 said, yeah. hey, we want to vote our sheriff. And yeah. now there's some people on the, uh, the commission that are reviewing the charter saying, hey, we want this to be an appointed position. So I believe this. I believe there's a reason why people want to have their... Uh, to be able to elect people to this office of sheriff as well as council as well as executive as well as all the things we get to vote on. It's really important that um, I take myself as a voter. I'm an informed voter and it's, and it's what I want to do. I want to have say in who is the sheriff of King County. And I did go testify on the topic um, and I don't know um, you know what they took away from my testimony but I would tell you that I believe that that um, there there may have been folks on on the Charter Review Committee that both were in favor of keeping an elected sheriff and not in favor of it um, there were a lot of people from the city of Seattle on the Charter Review Committee and so there may be used to one an, an appointed person I just believe that when it comes before the county council that the county council will move forward in keeping an elected office and not taking that recommendation from the charter review company. Do you think that, that this would be an example of why not having the King County Executive have being appointed, you know, appoint the person like the, what you're doing with the SOP right now with the EPU? You know, that having this independent, I get, go back to, you know, number three of your directives was 
that this was to be done independent of the King County Executive. Mm -hmm. And so this would be an example of how it's great to have an elected official because you're not under the King County Executive's purview. Well, I think it, it provides uh, an opportunity for me to speak out about law enforcement issues. It also is important because then the public knows who to hold accountable if we're not serving as they want us to. And so you can't be an effective law enforcement agency without having public trust. Being an elected official allows for that public trust or, you know, in 2021, they can make a different choice. And so I think the separation of, of the office from, because I worked here under, when it was an appointed position under the executives at the time. I think it gives you um, the ability to bring to the community things that may not, you may not be able to bring forward as an appointed people, person like, for example, budget, uh, priorities of the sheriff's office, um, what things are important to the community that we address first, second, and third. It, it has an independent ability to go out and speak and not necessarily be aligned with the executive or the council. I think that's important.